Right okay. Uh, well, I'm here with uh, Jim Dugan, esteemed uh, citizen, of, former citizen of Riverdale, Maryland, and uh, now somewhere down in Florida there. But Jim was the, the union uh, president of Local 6 of the Pressman's Union back in uh, 1975, October 1st, when a strike uh, broke out at the Post. But before we get into that, I wanted to just uh, get your background, uh, where you were born, uh, parents, brothers, and sisters, early Influence. I have all the of them. Of You've got them all of the <laughs> yeah, above? all of the oh, above. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, you, you grew up uh, in... I grew up in Hydesville, Maryland. Hydesville, okay. And uh, when I got married, I moved to Greenbelt, and then from Greenbelt, we moved to Riverdale. That's where we stayed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Riverdale's the town too tough to die. Man, that's pretty <laughs> impressive. And you were at one time on the city council. There, I, I was served a term. Calls at midnight from <laughs> fresh. Yeah, yeah. City, city council for one term. Once was enough. Mm -hmm. Now you, uh, <clears throat> uh, just just a little bit about your family background, brothers, sisters, obviously mother and father. Obviously, uh, that's uh, well. That's how I'm here. My parents were immigrants from Ireland. My father was a bricklayer. Mm -hmm. I have uh, three brothers and two sisters. Mm -hmm. um, grew up in Hydesville. Mm -hmm. But was your uh, dad involved in union activities? Oh yeah, my father was involved in the bricklayers union uh, all his life, and his brother was, and uh, my grandfather was. So that really was a, a big influence. He grew up hearing about it all the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, with, so you uh, went to, uh, I can't remember what high school you went to there. I went to Archbishop John Carroll High School yeah. in Washington, D.C. Right. <laughs> I'm trying to remember a few, well, we could get that, but there were, uh, you, um, and you uh, married, uh, uh, what, uh, how old were you when you? Uh, I started dating my wife when she was a sophomore in high school, and we got married when we turned 21. Okay. Um, what was her maiden? McGregor. McGregor, okay. Um, and, uh, and then you had, uh, how many kids? Five uh, children. And, um, and when did you, uh, was the Post your first job? Did you work other Oh, no, no. I, I started at the Washington Daily News, mm -hmm. and I was replacing someone who was in the service. And in order to get in the union, the first job came open up to Labor Press, and I went there so I could be in the union. Mm -hmm. From the Labor Press, I went to the Star. Then I went to the Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. Then I went back to the Daily News for my apprenticeship. And when I became a journeyman, I went to the Post. Right. And it was also common, wasn't it, that you of people that worked at one might move around to the... Oh, yeah, we worked at all the papers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was a lot of guys who started in one shop and stayed there, but mm -hmm. most of us moved around. And, and what year did you wind up at the Post? Uh, 1966. And I know I've read a lot and heard from various people in the union that the Post had pretty much been a union-friendly uh, place up in the late uh, 50s. At, uh, Eugene Meyer was made an honorary pressman and all of that. Is that? Uh, they were they were decent people to deal with uh, up until about um, I guess about '68 or '69 is when they started taking a turn, and then they turned even further after that. What was there any thing you saw that happened that caused them to, to turn? With the uh, as I know in '71, I guess it was they went public, and then they. Catherine Gray making all their pronouncements about you know, increasing profits, maximizing profits and all of that. Yeah, I think when she took over, she wanted to make her mark. And her whole idea was that um, she was responsible to shareholders mm -hmm. more so than anyone else. Mm -hmm. Before that, we would have, uh, we'd have uh, problems, but you were always able to resolve them. Mm -hmm. After that, they brought in a whole new management team. Uh, there was no resolving problems. When, uh, when did you uh, become president of the union? Uh, did you work? Did you go? I think I file? became president in, in either 72 or 73. I don't really remember now. Right. But you were very active, obviously. I've been active from the time I got my journeyman's card. Right, right. And at that point, I know in 73, Larry Wallace came in. Who was the predecessor of uh, uh, Larry Kennelly, and that was when still. Um, what was a guy that ended up at the Star? He was still the general manager there. Um, mm -hmm. Can't think of his name right now. But uh, Kennelly was a labor representative until uh, Larry Wallace. How was he to work with? Uh, Kennelly, you could work things out with. But, mm -hmm. but when they brought him in, they when they brought in uh, Wallace, they kept Kennelly for about a year. Mm -hmm. But they just cut a cut off his legs, you know. And he was, uh, you'd ask him a question, and he he'd mm -hmm. say, well, that 
that was your position. He wouldn't. He would never admit that that was an agreed to agreement. And, and how did this emphasis on getting tough with the unions? How did that reflect itself in the press room? What were some of the uh, uh, things that you experienced? I know that I know a few of them myself, but I was wondering. What well, they they put pressure on. They started, you know, sending letters out to people's homes. And we would reject these things because it wasn't covered by contract. But they would, they would upset people's families. Mm -hmm. They would uh, just in general start pushing. They'd, throughout the entire building, they would try and make changes. Mm -hmm. And they would get away with it with most of the unions. But our union had a unique clause in the contract called the status quo. And when they would try and change something, we'd say, well, we'll invoke the status quo. You try and change it, you won't get any production. Mm -hmm. So they'd stop, said, so you, if you want to negotiate on it, mm -hmm. bring it up to the next negotiations, or, or you can arbitrate it. But mm -hmm. um, we resisted at everything from, from that point once uh, they had already declared that they were going to do away with us. So. Yeah, and weren't they also um, suddenly, re, quote, unquote, reclassifying positions? You're, you're laid off, but you can come back on as part-timers with no benefits. <clears throat> well, they tried that one time. Yeah. They, they were, um, they scheduled so many different shifts and they decided that uh, since we had a pool of workers, they, they wanted to lay off, I think it was about 30 people and just hire them when they needed them. So when they laid them off, instead of us agreeing to that, we sent the guys down for unemployment and we taxed our members and made sure that all these people got a full week's pay every week. So after about I don't know, five or six weeks of it, they've determined that we weren't going to quit, so they hired people back. Mm -hmm. and, and it was also uh, correct that the pressmen in negotiations sort of set the standard for the, the building. I mean, a number of things that you got that other unions then got, so I, as I recall, cost of living, automatic cost of we, living. We were, um, we were a very aggressive uh, group of people, and we, we um, did our homework as to what conditions were around the city and around the country, and we tried to um, try to make good working conditions and good contracts for our people. Mm -hmm. well, there was um, uh, in 1974, I guess it was the, uh, the printers' union, right? They what they staged a walkout. I'm trying to remember the details. It was called the Padilla Affair. The Padilla Affair. <laughs> yes. Remember now? Yes. Yes. They had a, uh, I don't know exactly what precipitated it, but they fired a, pinner, a printer named uh, Mike Padilla, I think his name was. Mm -hmm. So the printers did a wildcat, and they were on the street, and um, we sat down, the other unions and ourselves sat down with management and tried to resolve the issue, because management already said they were going to print. They brought people in. Mm -hmm. um, we were on the street and couldn't reach an agreement, and they said they were going to print and we were walking up the street and I, I just said let's go in and I said follow me and we went inside and as soon as we got inside um, there was a guy's name John guy was running the place at that time big tall guy um, yeah. um, his name escapes me yeah, at the moment but he's jumping up and down what a statesman you are you're a great statement you brought everybody in. I go yeah excuse me for a minute I went into the room and I told the guys I said look get up on these machines tear out everything open up those windows. We're all going to come out of here bleeding if we have to. Mm -hmm. uh, they, at that point, we saw people, uh, management people and other rats that they had there where they were intending to print. But, yeah. uh, we ran them out of the room. Didn't hurt anybody. Didn't, you know, just... Mm -hmm. They brought in some, uh, like a SWAT team for a few minutes. And I told them, I said, you're going to have to shoot us. And uh, that stopped it. And then we went up and sat down and, and um, they agreed to rehire the fellow. The problem with it afterwards, I tried to talk to the printers union and they, um, uh, no one, none of their officers really wanted to discuss anything. Oh my God. So from there, we were sort of a target then. They knew that um, because all of our people, uh, it wasn't just our, our leadership, I think all of our people participated. Mm -hmm. People, guys that you wouldn't believe climbed up on the, on the press and stood in front of the window and ripped sheets out. And uh, mm -hmm. they knew that... Uh, I knew they were going to have to shoot us. Yeah. So. During the course of that, you mentioned something that, uh, jumping back a couple of years, the Post uh, had been sending people to the Southern Production Program, or whatever it's called, the School for Scabs in Oklahoma City, to train people to take the places of. That was an ongoing, ongoing and program. You knew about that. Oh yeah. So this was well, a thorn in the. They, they, they made sure that we knew about it. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was provoked, you know, very provocative. Yes. We, we can replace you. We got people being in training. Right, right. And then you have the 
I said the, the Padilla affair, and um, and it was I trying to remember the '74 when I and others as members of the newspaper guild, not my decision, but I voted for it, <laughs> uh, said we'll go out on on um, oh. uh, on strike, but nobody else has to honor the picket lines. All the other unions can practice. We are so terrific. The public will just what say, was it a strike? Man, where are all those wonderful bylines? We a strike saw? for excellence or something? Or right. some, some? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I yes. remember that. Well, the, and the thing was, of course, it was a miserable failure because after about four or five days, various reporters saying, "Jesus, the company hasn't crumbled under the weight of our our activity here." And um, I know I had talked to you about this before. Your uh, position always was that if that they told you what the, the guild leadership told you what they were doing. And you had said you'd be willing, pressmen and all the other unions. Would you be put up to a support. picket line. We won't. Pass, we, won't we won't cross, cross it. it. Yeah. It's very said, simple. No, no. We want you to cross. It. Yeah. This is, this is the one most bizarre <laughs> labor. I'm, I'm trying to remember the exact term of it. Was um, yeah. Um, withholding our withholding our excellence. Yeah, that's, that's what, what withholding our. Right. <laughs> now the thing is about the newspaper guild is it isn't just reporters. No. People often think about that. that they're also classified ad people and display ad people. So it wasn't. But this was the. The quote unquote elite reporters saying that they, they would miss us so much. And that was when, um, what's the guy, um, the two reporters, Bernstein and Woodward, that was when um, Bernstein, I think it was, went behind the leadership's back and was, he, was, he was trying right. to negotiate uh, a deal. And, uh, <laughs> he thought he was above it all. Still there, actually, Walter Pinkus, I think, was the. Yeah, that's right, I forgot him. Uh, but in any event, what that did from the <coughs> membership of the guild's perspective is it turned a lot of people against the leadership of the guild, saying, what in the hell are we doing there? And that sets the stage then for the, the October 1st strike, I and mean, it's one of the elements, I think, in, uh, in why some of these uh, ridiculous guilds people did not uh, go crossing the picket line. But in any event, there were a lot of uh, events leading up to the uh, strike that we talked about were there. And, and I think you once m mentioned that the Post got even worse on handling any grievances at all, whether it was safety grievances or... Yeah, they just, <clears throat> it, it was just about open warfare. I mean, they'd, yeah. uh, whenever, whenever they'd provoke, mm -hmm. we'd respond, you know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But it was just, uh, the production went to hell. Nobody really cared, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was just a, a downhill slope. Mm -hmm. uh, so on the uh, midnight or thereabouts, it was on October 1st, 1975, the Local 6 uh, went on strike and of course uh, amid events that the Post later uh, characterized as destroying the presses, as vandalism, millions of dollars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. From, from your perspective and whatever you can tell us about what I mean, the contract had expired, that was... Uh, contract expired, we had strike sanction, we went out, I guess, about, I think it was around 1 o'clock in the morning, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, there was damage done. The damage done was superficial. There were sheets torn out, there were some blankets torn. The um, place was trashed, but the place wasn't destroyed. The place wasn't, they, we didn't damage equipment. They were, they were some minor things, but uh, I think it ended up totaling something like $10,000. Well, yeah, some of us... Followed up on that, yeah. The the uh, the indictments that subsequent. We'll get to that in a bit. But they referred to the removal of parts, the former noses. Ah, uh, the old former noses. So that they couldn't. You couldn't <laughs> operate the press, but it wasn't quote unquote destroying. The press. No, no. And if in fact, um, if in fact we had taken all of the former noses, uh, they wouldn't have printed. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, Goss was, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think Goss was having a strike. Goss, some manufacturer of the presses, they couldn't have printed. But um, um, there was only a few of them missing, as far as I recall at this point. Mm -hmm. so, you don't have to have one around the house. I, uh, <laughs> this is my nose. This is not my former nose. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, the, the, I mean, obviously, the tensions have built up to a really high point. I mean, this wasn't just, uh, you know, walking off the job. No, no, right. people, people, people were bitter. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It, had, it, it had been carefully orchestrated. They had put publicity people in place. They, they were provoking people at all times. Um, 
the people they promoted into foreman's positions, uh, almost all of them went back in as, as scabs. They were all the biggest, strongest, uh, wackiest uh, of, of us, and, and we are a fairly wacky group, I guess. Yeah, um, I and uh, <laughs> it was always provocation. And, uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so, um, and the Post, as I recall, missed one day of publication, and then they began flying in helicopters to yeah they brought they brought in scabs in helicopters right over top of the um, the White House through mm -hmm. airspace that's classified and mm -hmm. if you remember the Russian embassy was right next door to the post and they yes. brought in helicopters there and they provided people into their building and before they, John goes on I, there was just one question having had um, 35 years or so to look back on it um, had you got, if, had the, the opportunity again to uh, replay the events, how would you have handled that night? I'd be guilty of everything I was accused of. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> no. I, I, um, the head of the, 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 the newspaper division at the Teamsters said to me um, 10 years later, or 15 years later when I was working there, anybody who wants to put a press out of commission can put it out of commission for six months easily. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, if you can destroy it, but the easiest way to do it is if you take all the former noses, no one, you cannot operate a press without that part. It's a very simple part, and it has to be reproduced and machined to fit. Mm -hmm. So if you take all of these and set them aside, you're not going to, you're not going to publish. And when the uh, post uh, had some I had that old flyer around here with it showing the headlines from the Post at the time. They trumpeted uh, millions of dollars of damage. They filed, eventually filed a $15 million uh, damage suit. Uh, they talked about uh, you know, wrecking the, the presses. Uh, and um, as, you, uh, as you said, that was far from the case. But then, uh, in addition, the, uh, the U.S. attorney jumped in with a, a, a grand jury uh, uh, investigation. And before I even get to that, though, the Newspaper Guild, still in its uh, craziness, uh, met and voted overwhelmingly to cross the picket line. And uh, I and a few others stayed out on the first day. Some other people, once they wised up, came out on the second, third, and fourth day. And, and at the most, probably at any time, 200 and so of the 800 members, most of them from classified ads or, or display ads, were actually honoring the picket line, but, um, uh, and some of the uh, language at the post meeting, one guy got up and said, uh, you know, these people, these people are trying to destroy my newspaper. They're just a bunch of slack-jawed cretins. What are we even talking about? And then, then all the, the propaganda became coming out. Not only were they racist, but Jim Dugan owned a whole stable of racehorses in Potomac, and I, when I visited him first time in Riverdale, I said, oh, the horses, damn it. <laughs> but, uh, so there was the, the, both the formal propaganda machine of the Post itself, I mean, you know, and the informal one of uh, oh, it, oh, the others, they all got records. They all got records. They all they, you know, wanted in several cities. I mean, as if that made somehow what the, the Post was doing correct. But it, it was, they were able to plan in the public's mind this is a violent union, and the poor Washington Post was, this is like, you know, destroying the First Amendment. Yeah, the only, the only people that um, gave us even a chance, an opportunity to talk, was Channel 5 at that time. There was a yes. guy named Roy Meacham, is that, yeah, is that the name? Right. Yeah, I forgot. Well, there's one coming back. Yeah. Um, and and uh, they ended up dumping him, I think, shortly after that, because of he was... Uh, they had, they had control of the entire media. Well, one of the things Meacham did, and, and a couple of us in the Guild had, had done it, um, had called the Goss company and said, what are parts of the Post reordered? And we got a figure it was something like $13,000 worth of replacement parts. Uh, Meacham called them, got a lower estimate, like 11000 or something. And then a guy from the Chicago Tribune, their labor columnist, back in the days when they had labor columnists, he got it roughly the same figure. So this whole business of millions of dollars of damage suddenly had come down into the the low teens, uh, and it was. But it was a great 
propaganda tool. So many people have used that as an excuse. I don't want to support this union. They're, they just they tried to destroy the presses. Uh, but getting to the, the U.S. Attorney's uh, uh, grand jury investigation, this was, of course, Earl Silbert, who had been the initial Watergate um, case prosecutor that sort of botched the, the early Watergate investigation. We all felt pain of, of, off a favor to the Washington Post to make it look good in their view. They announced this investigation into uh, a conspiracy to destroy the Washington Post. What then happened in, as far as the union's ability to fight with the strike and... Well, they, they uh, started issuing indictments and, and uh, calling people down to, to testify before the grand jury. Mm -hmm. And of course, that, everybody was just going down to take the Fifth Amendment. All you're doing right. is you're just trying to take up our time, which they did. They took up our, our time and our resources to, uh, mm -hmm. to uh, represent people. Um, it just, just was an ongoing process, uh, kind of a charade. Uh, but it did, it did disrupt the flow of what we were, uh, instead, of, instead of prosecuting the strike, we were busy uh, trying to make sure that they didn't you know, get away with anything uh, mm -hmm. silly and before the grand jury. Yeah, and then, uh, and during this uh, period, or as it went on, a lot of people, uh, local six members, uh, as I recall, lost houses and, uh, and couldn't pay the mortgages, couldn't we had, pay the uh, cars repossessed. We had a lot of that. We had um, one member uh, commit suicide, yeah. uh, John Klaus, right. which yes. was horrible. Yes. Um, he was not working on the night the strike started. He tried to get jobs somewhere as a security guard, and they called the post for his references. and. He couldn't, they would not give him any sort of recommendation to, uh, mm -hmm. they said without a recommendation from your former employee, mm -hmm. you can't uh, be hired, and he took his life. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember the, the Post was also playing that as if, if he was unhappy with the union. I remember that one of their stories that was there. Uh, well, the union ended up uh, representing his widow and uh, um, prosecuted a um, workman's comp claim and was successful. And you mentioned you couldn't get jobs elsewhere. That was it, it, during the course of the strike and as it went on. That was what other pressmen were finding from local six as they went to other cities. Uh, was there a, a blacklist of uh, sorts that was a little little bit of that around the country? But people weren't leaving uh, quite yet. And uh, mm -hmm. but you couldn't you couldn't get a job in the city or in the suburban area uh, doing something else. Mm -hmm. Where did you work? Oh no, we're not. You, you know, you're mm -hmm. you're part of that group. Uh, you're not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, most guys, as it ended up, went out of town eventually because there were still union contracts. Got work. Mm -hmm. um, some of the closer places, like Baltimore, took in a few people, but they uh, they absolutely told us there was a group of us that weren't going over there. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But uh, and the star was. Uh, well, we you. we. We, we put our people to work at the Star subbing and, and tried to divide up all the work in the city so everybody made about the same amount of money anyway mm -hmm. until the Star folded. Right. John, I want to go back sure, to the grand ahead. jury for one yeah, minute. Yeah, sure. Because um, grand juries had been used against unions in the past in some ways, but this was um, unique in the current era in terms of a regular labor dispute and not an investigation <coughs> of communists. And to subpoena, it turned out over a hundred strikers. And, and it, at first, um, your, your labor, I mean, and labor lawyers were generally not equipped, you know, didn't know what this stuff would be and people were urged to cooperate. We had at that time a, a uh two attorneys who had been representing the union for quite some time and uh, uh, were respected. But when we got into this problem, uh, they all of a sudden sort of took the position, unless we're being paid, you know, get your money up front when we were paying them, but we could just see where it was, uh, they, were only, they were only doing what they had to do and making sure they were collecting their money. Mm -hmm. And these were people that we had, uh, we had held in high esteem. Mm -hmm. um, we got rid of them, that's when we got uh, David Ryan and, and Joe Ford to represent us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got uh, a lot better representation and a, and a different tact to, uh, to defend ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the fact that all those uh, uh, members who did go before the grand jury, not 
one of them uh, broke the I mean broke the silence. They all took the. Uh, no, I, I believe them. some people talked to him, but they had really they had nothing, nothing to say. There yeah. was nothing. Uh, yes, yes. There was no grand conspiracy and or yes, anything yeah. to to destroy them or. But, and and as the strike uh, went on into October and November, somewhere in there, you had another negotiating session with the Post, uh, where they presented a final offer. Uh, yeah, that they, happened. A little yeah, they they gave us a final offer, which in effect eliminated the uh, uh, any any working conditions, any manning provisions. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's, they they knew there was no way we would accept it, uh, and we didn't. Catherine Graham, in fact, was quoted in her own newspaper as saying, "If Dugan had uh, local six had accepted this, I would have quote." slit my throat. Had That's she it. put that on paper previously, I might have signed that yeah, contract. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, so, and that the, and, uh, and her, her son, I believe, also said that, uh, uh, well, I, I know what it was, I was reading an old, old uh, handout by some of the Guild members, where somebody who came out of the, the building after she'd been working there for another Know, four weeks into the strike because she and some others asked for a meeting with Catherine Graham and and said they were concerned about the way the Post was negotiating this and she said we want to get rid of the union and she said that's what finally made her to come out because she's heard it from the horse's mouth that you know well, she was no upfront about it before I mean yeah. some sometime before that she said in the uh, in the cafeteria up there one time, she was sitting with Charlie Davis. Uh, and he was the president of the Stereotypers at that time. She said, we're going to get rid of you people. We're going mm -hmm. to tame you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and so the, the final offer came and it was rejected something like 250 to 6. Well, um, your, your memory's way better on and, that than mine. Uh, I, <laughs> I don't remember that. I don't, I, don't really, I don't really remember anybody voting for it, but, but you might be right. And, but I mean, it, I mean, here you are on the verge of being kicked out forever, and people, instead of saying, well, maybe we'd better vote for it, it was so bad oh, it was that virtually no one voted. Nobody. I don't think anybody voted for it. You had some people then that made a decision and, and instead of voting against it, went back in. You know, oh, you I had see. a handful of, of people um, cross the line, you know, become scabs. But I don't recall anybody standing up and speaking in favor of it or voting for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then. Uh, so then they began, um, they announced their plan to, which they'd had all along, which they dubbed, by the way, Plan X, in their own telling of it, Plan X was, was, was the scab strike-breaking uh, plan. And, um, and that's when my fellow guildsmen uh, had another meeting, and, and where we had all these people say, they bring in scabs, you'll see me out there on the picket line. It was like it hadn't happened. I mean, people just were more vehement than ever. We've wasted enough time on this, Bob Woodward said, let's go back to work. And, uh, and so they did, and except for you know, a bunch. And uh, how big a factor was the Guild's failure? To, forgetting about all this excellence crap, but <laughs> the failure was... Uh, well, any time they're all going back in, you're, you know, you're being cut off. Yeah. Uh, that was big. I think one of the bigger ones was uh, the Mailers Union, which... Um, uh, we always bargained together and supported them in every way. And uh, here, uh, Charlie Scott's still negotiating to, to get a settlement, and, mm -hmm. and he put them back to work. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, um, Paper Handlers Union, which was a member of my international, did the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, negotiated and went back in. So we, they, in effect, cut us off. Everybody was, uh, was back to work except the Pressman, Pressman's Union. And, and at that time, Pressman and Stereotypers were one union. Mm -hmm. um, so it just. Uh, the, the, the printers gotten back then. Printers went back to work too. Yeah. Sa same time that the um, that the uh, mailers went back, the printers went back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometime in December, there uh, roughly this time, 37 years ago, then a bunch of us in the support group got a that ad that we ran in the Washington Star, which you had uh, agreed. To, and we knew what your position would be anyway, to urge both parties to get back to the bargaining table. We got about 150 or so local and national figures to sign it, calling upon people to, for both parties to go back to the bargaining table. <coughs> so this, this ad uh, was signed by people like 
Hubert Humphrey, George McGovern, all local uh, leaders, uh, Monsignor, uh, I'm trying to remember the labor. Uh, Higgins. Higgins, Monsignor Higgins. Oh, yeah. There were labor people, there were community people. Uh, members of the DC City Council refused to talk to Post reporters during that time, something that wouldn't happen today. Uh, some of them signed the ad, some state representatives and senators from Maryland. I mean, it was a really, uh, and Davy Marlin Jones, critic of the uh, movies and oh, yeah, people yeah, that yeah. would sign. Uh, so we had a, a, a lot of uh, varied people on this, this ad. Needless to say, the Post rejected that and it was uh, complete uh, from, from that point. That all that Local 6 could really do was fight the grand jury, I assume, or was there, did you ever see any glimmers of hope in there at all? No, at that, at that point, uh, uh, I know I was pretty well convinced we were never going back. Yeah. Um, people who wanted to go back uh, had already went. People who yeah. decided to become scabs went, but uh, um, we, we got, uh, they, they cut us off, they isolated us from the other unions. Mm -hmm. We had a meeting with uh, George Meany one time, yeah. and we had all of the unions um, local and international represented, and he turned around and asked a question. He says, is everybody with you? And I said, they're here right now. I asked them, and uh, they all, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and of course, uh, there were several of them uh, already, already dealing with them. Um, um, somebody say something. Oh, uh, uh, um, uh, electricians union uh, was put their own people in there when they had a picket line up themselves. The, um uh, January 1st of, of that 76, Catherine Graham had a party, a, crisp, a New Year's Day party at her house. Union people, I think, I can't remember his meaning, but some very top uh, union, international union people were the, attending. And mm -hmm. that was, uh, so I had a very bad inkling that nothing was. Yeah, I don't, I don't really remember that. There. Um, do you, do you recall that, uh, I think it was Eugene who approached me and then we talked to you about it, where I went and had a dinner with Donald Graham, do you recall that at all? No, that's, I can't yeah, remember well, that. It was, it was a failure. Did we go? <laughs> no, he said, you know, could, you know, what about making some last appeal to him? I hear he's, you know, sort of a, a easy guy to talk to. You know him? I said, oh yeah, I know him. No, no, no. We, we had a lot of people, um, um, old timers, Basically, stereotypers, guys who had uh, been there for 30 years or something, and they would, they would always come up with the thing. Do you think she knows? Oh, and know. it used to crack me up. My God, do you think I see? Now? I think she knows. Yeah. <laughs> you know, how uh, insulting is that to say that she doesn't know? Yeah. Yeah. I go. That's she, uh, just, she knows. Yeah. No, that was, um, <laughs> so from that point, um, then. And, and the, Donald Graham was a zero in my book. I mean, he the guy was just nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What, uh, I'm just trying to recall um, what dealings you had. Uh, mm -hmm. This is sort of an obscure point that Mark Mayer, as I recall you saying, he attended the same church. And Mayer was what, vice president? What was he at the time? At the time? Uh, he he might have been the, the, um, the head of the business side at that time. He grew up in Riverdale. Mm -hmm. His father owned a pharmacy there. Mm -hmm. um, when he started talking to him at first, he sounded like a reasonable person, but uh, mm -hmm. they had um, they had put their plan in effect and they were going with it. They were, mm -hmm. their, their, their idea was to uh, take no prisoners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and they won. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and Larry Wallace, when he did come in in 73 and, and thereafter, I mean, what was the typical dealing with him? Just Larry Wallace was a very professional guy. You could catch him lying in an outright lie, and you would point it out to him that you just you just told a lie, and he'd say, "I misspoke myself," and that just go right on. You couldn't embarrass a guy. He was uh, he was a tough guy. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but, and um, so the, so the grand jury investigation dragged on, they returned the indictments, uh, and there were a lot of 15, was it 15 people? Uh, felony charges of one type or another, uh, assault and battery, uh, destruction. There's only one person put in jail, mm -hmm. uh, Jack McIntosh, mm -hmm. and he served uh, one year in, in D.C. jail for um, 
I think a salty. He think he's hit somebody. Uh, yeah. And um, that was something we was tried. Something to, apart from what went on. Yeah, but we we tried to discourage people from that. You know, you you're not going to win any support doing that. Mm -hmm. People were emotional. Mm -hmm. And uh, and all those felonies suddenly evaporated, and they became uh, misdemeanors, and people plead guilty to misdemeanors, mm -hmm. and some got fined, some got. Uh, Halfway house work release. It was it was, one person was kind of a joke. Uh, uh, like I said, the only one who, who got time was Jack. Um, it was just it was just a um, another to focus instead of focusing where we were supposed to be focusing. We were trying to make sure that nobody ended up going to jail or, or having any problems. And at the same time, you're trying to trying to uh, generate enough work to to you know. So we we split the work up so. Uh, you'd get a day's pay or two days pay a week working at the Star and the, and the Journal. To uh, add to Fred's point earlier about the grand jury, I mean, sent, uh, Congressman John Conyers of Michigan at the time put statements in the congressional record saying this was to his, and he comes from a labor state, obviously, he said this was un, an unprecedented use of a grand jury to break a union during the course of a, of a labor dispute. And, uh, and then, so it was in the, the local press, uh, you mentioned Channel 5, uh, which did do some good, but the Star was, they had one story that sort of... Uh, Star stayed around. silent, pretty yeah. much. They just didn't report on it, uh, basically. Yeah. Um, and uh, as, as I often said, if the, uh, if the Village Voice had been here in D.C., we would have done quite well because their columnists were always writing articles and support us. <laughs> they did, they did. But, and, and some national publications did, but otherwise people here were getting their news that, yeah, this is the, the post is the sainted Catherine Graham. That's and, it. And all the, the plaudits in the years, uh, years to come. Then I guess to, to wrap, maybe wrap up, and Fred can add some. We movie All the President's Men came out in uh, early 1976. The Kennedy Center premiere, Robert Redford. And, oh yeah. And Dustin Hoffman and all the, the directors and Bob Woodward, Carl Bernstein and. I was in the outside group of 500 people, or so, probably about a block away, but as Fred was recalling, or someone today was, or Riskin, I guess, was recalling that some pressmen or supporters went inside. Yeah, there was a, probably about 50 of us inside. Mm -hmm. um, that's where I'm thinking of uh, Suzanne Groft. Yes, and she, uh, yeah. she started the singing, We Shall Overcome. And of course, here are all these, uh, um, um, liberals supposedly are walking up and, and you can see them looking back saying, I never thought somebody would do it to me. You know, and it's like, <laughs> like we were, they were being embarrassed, but uh, yes, yeah. uh, didn't... Uh, did they shoot you out of there? Or did they I, no, I stay? think at that point they, they left us in there for a certain period of time. I don't ever remember being, being forced out. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, it's a long, long time ago, yeah, uh, right, right. but uh, I do remember that. And so the charges were all resolved in, what was that, like June of 77 or something? But somewhere along in, in there. And then, uh, and you had um, stepped down as president sometime in of the local Senate. No, I got States. thrown out as president. I didn't thrown step out. down. Oh, I didn't know I this. got Fort, oh. Ray Forsman, who was a, a good man and a good friend, mm -hmm. uh, ran against me and beat me. And I. Uh, I asked him, what is it you hope to accomplish? And, and in fact, most of the other officers said they were really upset. And I go, well, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. He didn't know what he wanted to accomplish, but he thought possibly that uh, me being the figurehead, that uh, maybe they would talk to him. And he mm -hmm. found out very quickly that that wasn't, yes. wasn't going to happen. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. But uh, I, I always respected and still respect Ray, a, a good man. What was the wonderful guy that was the treasurer? Uh, Ray Collins. Ray Collins, yeah. I went to his Another, another good man. Said, yeah. Good guy. Yeah. Are you in touch with any of the... Uh, 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 Jimmy Ingram was vice president of the union, mm -hmm. and I speak to him. Uh, I, I went out to see him this summer. Where, where uh, he? He's in uh, Denver. He's retired. Mm -hmm. uh, just got two new hips. He's doing great. Mm -hmm. uh, Charlie Davis was a vice president of the yeah. union after we merged the unions. Um, He's not doing too well. He has blood clots in his legs right now, and he has a serious heart condition. But I spoke to him just yesterday, mm -hmm. um, and I still still speak to Raffo. And uh, <laughs> there's not there's not a whole lot of us left. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the people were older than me at that time, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this uh, I stay in contact with a few people.
just, I mean, when you, and when you mentioned that, it was similar, or when you were about 40 or something at the time, or the, trying to get your age, you I'm uh, 37 now, John. Okay, yeah. uh. <laughs> but, so some of it, I mean, it was really... Yeah, I was in my late 30s. It was even more wrenching than to, to suddenly be out of a job. Yeah, there were, guys, there were older guys that, yeah. um, it, it just depends. I, I mean, I had five children, uh, right. but I had a, had a very strong, my wife was very strong. You had guys whose wives were going crazy on them, and, and children entering college, and... Right. Uh, the funniest part about it, about it, looking back, is it was there was some people that their wives kept them out, and there was some people that their wives sent them in. You don't know who was, uh, mm -hmm. and you and and you could guess who was gonna who was gonna cross the picket line, and you'd guess wrong. You'd, mm -hmm. Some of the guys you thought were the strongest were the weakest, mm -hmm. and vice versa. Yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, um, uh, let's see, I was trying to think of any other points I wanted to ask you about regarding uh, the people. Uh, well, why don't we talk about the strike support a little bit? Yes, because that's a good idea. Yeah. it became um, you got introduced to a sort of whole new world. Absolutely. Um, well, in the course of the strike and all the uh, just look around this room, for example. <laughs> but um, you know all the different elements of the the left that um, you know united to try to work on the strike and. Uh, any of your, Irving Riskin talked about his discussion about uh, with um, Paul Baker. Paul Baker, thank you. I knew it'd come to me. Paul. <laughs> Reference that for Irving Riskin's interview. Not, yeah. That's the guy from Montgomery County. Okay. Um, but, you know, um, Jim Ingram, you ex I remember you explaining to Jim Ingram during the demonstration why the the good, some of the communists got to march up front, like the Alliance for Labor and Community Action. But some of the bad communists had to go to the back. And Jim Ingram was extremely confused about the difference between the good communists and the bad communists. So talk a little bit about your experience with, with all this sort of stuff. It, it was kind of funny on the picket line. People would wander up to you and start talking to you, and you're wondering who they are. But that's where I met uh, you. That's where I met Brent Dillingham, um, um, and, and the groups that they, the people that they brought in, and actually uh, the support from them and and the um, the the organizing of the groups. Um, I owe you, I owe you a great deal of uh, uh, credit for for your expertise in that and. Uh, the talent that came around, Sam Pizzagotti and, and John and, and uh, people who could write and, and do brochures and, uh, um, you know, all, all of the people that, um, that we met. And, there, and there, were, there were people who were a little, a little over the top, I would say, that we met that were <laughs> just a little strange. The They're a little strange. <laughs> the, the Harry Krishners had to march in the back. We, we had little rules like that. <laughs> but uh, it was just... Uh, was quite an experience, but uh, it, you had to, um, we, we had to sort of um, be a little cautious at first to find out who, who had what on their agenda. Was their yeah. agenda what our agenda was, or, or, or did they have something else on their minds? Mm -hmm. And uh, it took a little while, we, we, but uh, uh, I gained a great deal of friendships and, uh, and respect and admiration for, for the uh, people in the community that, uh, that really uh, showed us showed us the way. They, I mean, uh, uh, we, had, we had no experience. I'd been on strike, um, I guess, in 69, which is a couple days strike. So we didn't, we didn't have any uh, uh, expertise in this and uh, uh, pulling groups together, um, going before the National Council of Churches, um, going before um, City Council, all of these things. And um, um, that guy right there was probably more responsible for it than anybody else, Fred. Mm -hmm. um, but that was um, that was what helped us um, sustain it for yeah, so for we, what period we did sustain it. That's all. So we have it on. Yeah, Fred was invaluable. Fred, Absolutely. He was a, an annoying pest sometimes, but he was invaluable. I, I <laughs> often I often have trouble describing him. I don't know whether he's priceless or worthless. I get them <laughs> too mixed up. <laughs> uh, but, um, no, that's uh, that. Yeah, we, we were talking earlier about the, the publicity committee. We had, it seemed like each communist faction had 
people on there, and then someone who these ideological <laughs> disputes. And Chip Berlay would always bring it back. So we've got to get out of brochure. You can argue about this or that later, but right now we've got to get and out of I don't know whether you remember one time we did a play. Yes, yes. And, um, we have a picture somewhere. There. And I, I don't know whether it was a Chip Berlay that wrote the play and some other fellow that was a, a director or something. And the play was, uh, from, from what everybody said, was just hysterically funny. It was just a uh, real... It was real, uh, Unitarian... Yeah, he had all souls. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was... Uh, yeah. And then, of course, we did the... Um, we did our own grand jury... Um, People's Grand Jury. People's Grand Jury. We... Uh, um, the, uh, the, le the, uh, the left community at that point uh, um, gave us a, a, a good support. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, particularly being as a, so we were, we were so unpopular. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and because of these various charges that were being put around, I remember we were talking off camera, I think, about Josephine Butler, who uh, came out in support in, uh, at, at rallies. And uh, uh, when there were a lot of people that were holding back, uh, and she was very, uh, very much an outstanding lady. person, yeah. really, really a super lady. The uh, your international union were they sort of like a mixed blessing? We had sanction to to uh, strike. It wasn't a wildcat strike. Right. Once the strike started, um, Saul Fishko was the president of the international, a very conservative um, New York guy. Um, we we got our strike benefits. We did uh, we we got some support. Um, but they, um, they sued the International, and he was more concerned with what was happening with them, I think, than, uh, maybe I'm saying that wrong. He didn't give us financial support that we, sh we, we could have could have helped uh, more. As I recall, they, even before the grand jury, they subpoenaed people from the International, I think. I believe they did. Uh, no, I, I don't recall that uh, at this yeah. point. But uh, maybe, but um, maybe named him in the lawsuit. Yeah, yeah. He was in the lawsuit. The international, rather than defend the lawsuit, um, and and that was about um, um, somebody punching uh, Jimmy Hoover. Um, they paid it. It was cheaper for them to. This what, what litigation happens is people pay for something rather than fight it. It's cheaper, mm -hmm. and that's what they did, which uh, didn't sit well with me. I thought that they could have beat the whole thing. It was not uh, the post fifteen million dollar damage suit. Is that a, that's a different suit? That's a different suit. Did that that, that that's that, I don't know that that suit ever was actually filed. I I, yeah. I never saw it. I don't I don't recall yeah. it. It's just more publicity. You know, they're going to sue for fifteen million dollars or something. Uh, I don't. I, I think it was filed, but I, I don't really remember that now at this point. Mm -hmm. it was, you have an appearance next week on that problem. I do. <laughs> and they got as much chance of collecting $15 million now as they did then. Uh, um, I actually asked this of Irv, given his labor experience, but I mean, because it was, even though it was, they were out to destroy you, obviously, that must have been a very tough vote to make, so even a 250 to 6 vote that I said that your, your whole life and, and career is sort of passing before your, your eyes and you're saying, well, I mean, you have to have, I mean, you have to be thinking, we may never work again. But, yeah. but at the same time, by then, and having seen their final offer, but, you know, to, to mo most of us that are rational, know that, you know, it's over. We're not, we're not going back in there. We can, we can continue to try and prosecute the strike and do things, but uh, we're not... There's, there's no hope of getting back in there. Yeah. Irv, who has, of course, obviously 80 years of, of activism, much of it with union work, said that he had never seen a union that was so united and so uh, you know, cohesive and in, in, in agreement of, he said, that had a union spirit to them. He said he's, he's been in a lot of situations where uh, that just wasn't the case. And well, they, 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 helped, they helped unite us with the way, that, way they uh, with the provocation, so, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, Irv, Irv is someone else who was a, a real big help, a good man, really a good man. Uh, um, he and a couple of pressmen um, tried to organize boycotts out in the Montgomery County yes. area where yeah. you didn't really, um, really didn't have the, um, I guess, a real working class neighborhoods that you that you had in other areas, and they did a pretty pretty good job of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, just a wrap up with your own life after you left uh, 
after that, you showed it after you bought the liquor store. Or was it, I can't remember what year. But. I bought, uh, let's see, that had been 1978 or 70, late 78. I uh, mortgaged my house and bought a liquor store in New Carrollton, Maryland with partners other people put up money to. From that, I bought a same group of people. I bought another store downtown. Um, these stores were not um, super profitable because there was too many people living off it. When I finally got rid of the stores here and went to Florida, I uh, bought an auto body shop. And uh, then I opened up two more in a towing business and yada yada. And uh, mm -hmm. I did all right with that. I finally made some decent money and uh, was doing very well until my wife got sick. And then I sold everything. And that was what, 2005. Yeah, yeah. While you were still up in DC, to go back a little bit, you, um, even after the strike and the defense committee period ended, you stayed involved in helping a lot of stuff. You know, I remember... Yeah, I stayed involved for a couple... fundraisers with, um, for Chile, Solidarity, for instance, you know, at your, at your house, or um, even the uh, memorial march for when uh, Talia and Moffat were killed. Oh, yeah. You were out there doing some stuff and helping out with other strikes and remaining involved in the alliance. Now, I know you didn't stay very active when you moved to Florida, but that did seem to, um, that experience of the trike did, did have an impact on you in staying more open to other, other things and being involved in other things. It was an education, there's no doubt about it. And it worked the other way too. I mean, there were, uh, I can't remember what I mentioned before, but one of my, I may have been the only person around in the guild who had actually worked in a press room in my high school. And, and what I remember, and I was trying to remember, I think it was true with a lot of your members, Missing fingers, various uh, yeah, we'd, we'd have. respiratory ailments. I mean, it's not a. I don't know what the conditions are today in the industry, but it was there were still problems with, with that. Uh, we, I think we were pretty progressive uh, uh, union in in uh, looking out for our members. Uh, mm -hmm. We organized um, a um, a group from Ralph Nader's and did a. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Um, but anyway, we organized a thing to test everyone's hearing, oh, yeah. and then then we um, we organized where they they came into the press rooms and um, tested people, and they came in and tested blood pressure and things like that. The night they came into the press room, they took about five guys off the floor, sent them to the hospitals, Jesus. and after we did that, the post then agreed to let the rest that happened to the rest of the building, and then the the Washington Star did the same thing, mm -hmm. but. Um, this was uh, prior to um, uh, the way we do things now, uh, having health care, which is preventive. Um, we actually started that in the, I guess, around the, I, I want to say around 69 or 70. That's a local yeah, six initiative. Yeah, local yeah. six initiative. We, yeah. we um, uh, and it was surprising. Um, um, at that time myself, I found out I had hypertension by that and, and got care. and. Never had any problems, but uh, mm -hmm. it uh, there was like I said, four or five people they took straight to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So we got, uh, and then they eventually did it throughout the whole building. So it was, uh, it was uh, we we would do things that were you know trying to. Mm -hmm. We're gonna pause for a second. Just uh, yeah, some of the other people that you I don't remember if you mentioned on camera, uh, Britt Billingham. During this, you also made a lot of new good uh, friends besides being exposed to uh, left ideology. Yeah, Brent, Brent I met on the picket line and, and he wanted to know what he could do to help. And uh, 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 for those of us who remember Brent, he was uh, kind of a, uh, a, a wild looking guy with long hair and I looked and I, I had no idea what the hell he wanted. <laughs> and it took, it took a little while for me to, uh, I was trying to find out what, you know, what his interest was. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, it was comical finding out because as you know how funny he could be, mm -hmm. and uh, we we ended up becoming very very close personal friends. Uh, he was a, a just a just a wonderful person, just uh, extremely passionate about everything and any mm -hmm. anything you could think of that uh, that meant uh, something to help people. Mm -hmm. He was there for. Him. He was really good. And and you had uh, and some of your members. Uh, 
I wouldn't know how many, but some of them were already pretty politically conscious or, or conscious about left sort of politics. I mean, I don't know, if but I know I met a few during yeah. the, the course of it. We, we had people from, um, in our industry, if you had your union card and came into town and we had work, once you deposited your card, you were entitled to go to work. Mm -hmm. And once you deposited your card, you were a member of, the, of this local, and you're entitled to everything that everybody else is entitled to. Yes. So they would immediately go to work. And we had guys who had been all over the country or who had come out of strike situations in, uh, in Miami or, or uh, Detroit or all over the place. And uh, they were... They were um, they were they were people who had who had had exposure to it. Plus, pressmen read the papers every night. They read everything from back back to front. Uh, you know the whole thing. So they were conscious of what's what goes on in the world. And um, we, we maybe we weren't very well educated. Uh, most of us were high school graduates as all, well, but um, we're pretty well versed on on the politics of the country and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. One of the things I nagged at me over the years because I once asked the Teamsters lawyer about this well before this strike. Says, why aren't the drivers at the Washington Post organized? And they weren't, but they, they could just, as long as they could get past the picket line, they could drive. Uh, you know. I went out uh, numerous times trying to organize them. At that point, they, they were set up that they owned, if, if my memory is correct, that they owned their subscription list. The Post didn't. So they felt like they were an independent yeah. businessman that had his, his own... Uh, subscribers. Mm -hmm. Once we went on strike, uh, the Post took away the subscription list from them, and uh, the, the subscription list then became theirs, and of course they weren't organi organized, so right. they could do nothing about it. And uh, we had we'd tried to point that out to them prior to that, that you know, that they're not going to let you, they're not going to let you alone, yeah. and, uh, and of course they didn't. The, the business Teamsters lawyer, the Teamsters was pretty aggressive uh, union. I said, why don't, why don't you organize them? And he sort of hemmed and hawed, and a lot of people always suspected that the Post and the Teamsters had some sort of understanding, quote unquote. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know anything about that, but uh, mm -hmm. that was always, that was bandied about quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well. The only other thing I would add is, is uh, to the best of my knowledge, the only guild member uh, in the reporting department who stayed out on strike for the entire time is sitting beside me right now, my friend John. Yes, well, thank you, yeah. you, what, you were always admired for that, believe me. No, thank you very much. Do, do, you, do you know anything about conditions in the press room since the strike? The, the, the At the Post? Yeah. No, I don't, know, I, don't, know I, don't, I don't know anything about that. But nationally, our union uh, was taken over now by the Teamsters. Uh, the stories that I hear are that um, um, the representation is not re very strong for the pressman's union, for the pressman's part of their union. Uh, some of the contracts that have been signed, uh, particularly on the West Coast, are uh, uh, horrible the way I see it. But uh, there's there's very little um, the the term militant unionist is uh, is not used anymore. No, nobody seems to know where they went. Um, um, yeah. I did a story about 15 years after the, the strike about uh, it's the progressive magazine called Labor Pains at the Washington Post. And uh, as you might have expected, the newspaper guild didn't reap great benefits from being a scab <laughs> union. In fact, they got shafted for three years before they got a contract. And at the point I wrote the story, it had been another three years. And it, the same sort of petty harassment, they, they didn't recognize Obviously, it was in their own interests, their own selfish interest, to be out on strike and, and support of the union. Um, you know, there is one other thing I realized we did to ask you that. Of course, you've been away um, many years now, but um, it seems to me, as someone who's been here the whole time, that uh, this strike has kind of been disappeared. Yeah, um, yeah. The uh, the Nash, the, the uh, local. Um, Labor Council um, prints stories every so often and on Labor Day about strikes and all, but they, they never mention that one. Mm -hmm. I, no, I, I never, there's an online <laughs> newsletter that has lists important days in labor history, and uh, several times I sought to remind them about that date, and it's never been in, and then 
of course, as you know, I mean, I think part of it, part of it was the guild has <coughs> tried to rebuild, and this was not a pleasant memory for the guild, nor nor was it a very uh, shining hour for the newspaper guild. And as they continued to struggle and try to build, the last thing they wanted to remember was anything about the, the pressman strike. But also, as you, I think you know, at a year ago at the Labor, there's been a Labor Film Festival in D.C. for the last number of years, and what they sh and they showed all the president's men one night at the Labor Film Festival. I did not know that. Because <laughs> because Danny and I were, and John started working on it. And they had a couple showings. John got on a panel. We should have done it the way you would have done it which was just to pick at the, instead we, we bought this thing to go on a panel and they gave John about <coughs> eight seconds because they were real interested in uh, whistleblowing. The others, yeah, the other speakers are much more interesting. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so it has been kind of um, disappeared, yet, you know, um, worth knowing about because some say, um, that while everyone looks at PATCO as the uh, symbol for a new era, the uh, this strike and the uh, the turning of the liberal establishment, and Nancy and, and Catherine Graham was really close to the Reagans, actually, and you know this strike may prove to have had more historical importance than it's ever been given credit. No, the, the, the establishment now, it's, it's an accepted fact now that it's more important to make big money for your, for your CEOs and shareholders' returns than it is to be fair with your employees. I mean, that's the national trend right now. It's getting worse and worse. Like if Michigan just uh, became a right-to-work state, who, who would have thought that? Yeah. Never in my wildest dream would I have thought that. Yeah. And there, um, that, and the, the your local six was the, the, the pace setter at the uh, at the post and with the result was that unionism was, was dead and some people wrote that at the time like in the village voice well, one the one of the funnier things at that time was that the um, all of your government unions and they have a lot of printing going on in the government government printing office and, and the mm -hmm. treasury and all that they all got their raises and their money based on what we in the uh, outer sector got the government got what we we got mm -hmm. and uh, they would cheer us on to go in there and fight <laughs> and uh, just because they would get it for free mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. just uh, so uh, so, uh, so you've had a bad influence on your son Dan he went into union uh, work to uh, in the years to come huh? <laughs> I'm gonna disown him if he keeps this up <laughs> 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 He's had a, a little bit of a rough go at it with his own uh, local. Uh, oh, is that? Yeah. And uh, I could see why I got thrown out. I lost 400 jobs. He got them 600 jobs and they threw him out. I'm going, boy, you're really bad. You're worse than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. For, for the record, what he's talking about, they got the, uh, he brought the emergency medical text and everything into the firefighters union, uh, which was really unpopular with some of the retirees and things like that who get to vote in the firefighters union and he got beaten by an anti-growth retiree. One last thing I think this strike, and I didn't really mention this very, unlike a lot of strikes, this was not about wages per se, it was about who has some control of the press room. They wanted complete control mm -hmm. and our tradition had been for forever is that you tell us how many men you want we'll give you the men mm -hmm. and uh, all of a sudden they wanted to assign everybody they wanted they wanted to eliminate manning clauses mm -hmm. uh, so it, it was it was money also it wasn't the fact that we were looking for more money uh, at that point we'd have, we'd have gladly taken the last year's contract and a cost of living probably uh, they wanted complete control they wanted to be able to, to uh, do big speed ups 
No, it was just a, it was a, it was a well-planned mm -hmm. assault, and uh, unfortunately, they, they worked, uh, they won. And it wasn't about automation, either. There was no automation in our department at that time whatsoever. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I've seen people often confuse the printers and the press. That's right, yeah. that's right. They had, they had entirely, they were undergoing an entirely different um, uh, way to do their jobs. Uh, they were going from, from hot type to, to cold and where, you, where you'd use computers. Ours wasn't that situation at all. Mm -hmm. okay. well, thank you so much. Gee, it was wonderful. Parting, uh, <laughs> words, uh, uh, we buy high, a statement. Buy high, sell low. <laughs> <laughs>